Welcome to another edition of AP's Profiles in Christian Living. Uh, my special guest with me today is Reverend Paul McKendrick, one of the faceless men from M&M. Um, Paul, great to have you with us. Well, great to be here, Mark. Hopefully we're less faceless or uh, not as faceless as we will be. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I shouldn't be as cheeky when I say that because you actually do perform a very important role. For all those who don't know, m M&M and is a ministry and mission for the Presbyterian yes. Church of New South Wales. Yes. Um, Paul, start us off, tell us a little bit about how did you become a Christian and what made you decide to go into pastoral ministry? Yes, I uh, grew up in Launceston in Tasmania and grew up in a family that had a little bit of background with Christianity. So uh, within uh, the Anglican Church in Tasmania at that stage was um, relatively high. Uh, so I went to church, did com- communion, uh, was an altar boy for a little while, but then uh, pretty much sport got in the way of everything. I yeah. played a lot of sports, so that sort of uh, took off and I played so much sport I didn't have much time for God really. So I had a bit of a God consciousness, but it wasn't really actually until I was about 17 and I went to a, a crusade by a guy named Bill Newman. don't know whether anyone knows Bill Newman. Those who are a little bit older might remember him. He did crusades around mm. Australia and went along to one of his. And uh, there, I don't remember the exact message now, but it was pretty clear that he uh, presented Jesus, that he died on the cross, uh, that he rose again and that uh, to have eternal life I needed to believe and trust in him. And did one of those weird things and walked up the front, Mark. It was a uh, pretty... Strange thing as a 17-year-old to go and do that. Um, but one of the really great blessings of that was that uh, the lady, they used to have people that counsellors would talk to you. Mm. And uh, the lady that was at the back that ended up being my counsellor with a friend of mine who went up was actually probably one of the few ladies that were truly converted mm. at the Anglican Church that I grew up in. Wow. Uh, she was gorgeous, a uh, lovely lady. And uh, she actually started a little Bible study and wow. uh, we started to do that. Uh, at that particular time, I, um, I was uh, just starting to go out with my wife, Karina. Mm. She wasn't my wife at that point in time, obviously. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, there we. And then actually, Karina and I then decided to actually look at um, some other churches together, and that's how we end up in the Presbyterian Church. Oh right. Yeah, uh, her background's from the Presbyterian Church, mm. and we went to St Andrews in Launceston. Okay. Yeah, uh, and it was actually through that probably that we ended up heading towards pastoral ministry. I was a PE teacher for uh, three or four years, uh, three years, sorry, and um, uh, during that time a guy by the name of Nello Barbieri, Mm. a guy by the name of David Chai and uh, uh, were in pastoral ministry in uh, St Andrews and um, together with them they really just uh, pushed me to think about maybe going into pastoral ministry Mm. and then uh, I went to a conference in Collaroy and caught up with... um, Bizarrely, it was where Ravi Zacharias was the main teacher. Wow. Blew me away. And John Chapman and Dave Cook. And Dave Cook came up to me and said, uh, Paul, you need to go to Bible college. You've even got the <laughs> finger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Dave, uh, Dave uh, encouraged me. I went home to Karina and said, we're going to Bible college. She cried. Oh, right. Uh, but uh, she cried because uh, God had been uh, laid it on her heart oh, while I was away right. at the conference that this was probably the right direction to go. Wow. So, yes, yeah, so I went to college thinking actually that we would end up going probably do chaplaincy mm. and then um, in a school and so forth. Uh, after a couple of years at SNBC, decided that probably even to do that, it'd be great to be ordained in the Prezi Church. We're going to Epping Prezi at that time. Um, and so went across to, um, back then it was not Christ College, but uh, PTC, and uh, did two years there. Mm. Um, yeah, and I think in that last year of my time at uh, PTC, I was really um, challenged to actually go to pastoral ministry rather than chaplaincy. Yeah. It what was, caused uh, that? I think I became more and more convicted that uh, church pastoral ministry was probably where my gifts lay. Mm. Uh, Even though chaplaincy was something that I enjoyed, Mm. I really enjoyed uh, getting down and teaching the Bible, encouraging people to come to know Jesus, uh, grow in that and then go out and uh, reach others for Jesus. And the local congregation was probably where my heart was. uh, God was leading my heart. And particularly with Corona too, that meant that she could be part of that as well. So... Mm. I think that was probably what was uh, the, the case, yeah. Mm. So, okay, you graduate from PTC, yes. now Christ College, yes, and you end up at a little <laughs> coastal country town called Evans Head. Yeah, bizarre. How was that uh, all the way from Launceston? Yeah, from Launceston in the cold to mm. the far north coast of New South Wales, yeah. and it was hot. 
Um, yeah, bizarre. I, the reason we went there um, out of the options we had from college was actually that we thought it was the one of most need. A mm. uh, small little town, the likelihood of someone going there, even though it's on the coast. So there is a bit of an attraction there, isn't yeah, there? You yeah. know, it's tough. Some people are going yeah. to do that. Oh, look, you're suffering for the gospel. <laughs> yeah, we understand. Yeah. We've got to go there. Um, but it was uh, – we had never, never been there before. Mm. Didn't know about it. Um, was going to be working with Grant Thorpe, so that was a, a bonus, we thought. He mm. was at Ballina, so it was a Ballina Evans Head Bordell Presbyterian Church, uh, so I'd be his assistant okay. yep. uh, working in Evans Head. So it was the attraction to that, uh, a, a need uh, for there. And uh, because we come from Launceston, we're not really city people particularly. Mm. Um, we prefer to be out outside of the city. Mm-hmm. So that's what we thought. It was tiny. It was like a church of 20, 25 people, mm. one family. And um, we just thought, here's an opportunity. Uh, and so what happened? Because you were there for 22 years. Yeah, that opportunity went for a long time, didn't it, Mark? <laughs> it was yeah. 22 years. Yeah. That's crazy, isn't it? Um, oh, we, I, I think a couple of things. Uh, we grew to love the people. Mm. Uh, we really appreciated the town, the community, uh, the church, that uh, God's people that were there, though that was very small. I mean, it grew over a long period of time, took a long time, but... Uh, God did some amazing things there. It became um, quite a strong and healthy church in and of itself yes, by the time you left, didn't yeah. it? It was over, what, 100, 120 people? Uh, 160 odd people. Right. Yeah, so we had approximately 110 adults and about 50 kids. Wow. Um, we were meeting in a school by the time we left because we couldn't mm. fit inside our building. God did amazing stuff. Yeah, he, people were converted. Uh, people came because it was a small town. There weren't many other churches, no particularly evangelical churches. So people did move to town and they had some sense of mm. mainly on about Jesus and uh, the, the Bible's the way that we we get to know him through mm. that. Um, they would sort of connect with us. So we're pretty, uh, we're a very eclectic group of people. I don't think there were particularly too many people who had Presbyterian heritage. Right. Um, but we love that. Yeah. Um, that was great. It was a really a very special time. So yeah. I can see, you know, you've got a deep love for the God's people, deep love mm. for pastoral ministry. Why mm. would you leave? <laughs> Why would you go and work in a <laughs> denominational auxiliary ministry? I know. It's bizarre. What happened? I, I'm still trying to work that out. No. <laughs> um, it, is, it, is a bit, it is a bit bizarre and it's a God thing. Mm. Uh, that's what it is ultimately. Um, as I said before, we're not city people, so... Mm. Um, coming to the city, but there's no attraction to that specifically. I can say that our kids are all down this way. Mm. There was an attraction there, definitely, but to actually move to the city, no. To move out of pastoral ministry, that's not really an attraction either. Mm. Um, but I think in our last few years, particularly at Evans Head, um, we became more and more aware of the struggles of being in, in ministry, uh, the difficulties of that. Uh, uh, personally, lots of it was a, can I say Evans Head was an amazing place, but it was a very messy because mm. um, people are messy. Sin impacts everything, so it's a messy yeah. situation. Um, but we saw that happening across the board, I saw the difficulties that pastors were having within that. And I think even a number of years before we left, that God was laying on our heart that at some point in time, maybe we'll go and be a support somehow. Mm. Maybe the interim transitional ministry that was starting to happen within our denomination. Yeah. We thought maybe we'll do that. We'll do that in our last five or so years, you know. We'll go out and do that. But... Um, God brought that forward by 12 years or 13 years. Wow. Um, and uh, the, with Matt Oates coming to M&M uh, Ministry Mission, uh, it took a slightly, I would say, maybe a, a deliberately direction towards specifically looking at being healthy, multiplying churches. I'm not saying they weren't there before, but it, mm. it, it, the committee deliberately wanted to set off in that direction specifically. Mm. And with Matt Oates coming on board and then with the next person that they wanted to employ was to be in the healthy pastoral ministry area, specifically for pastors and their families to be healthy in ministry. Yeah, I think that just grabbed us. Both mm. Karina and I grabbed us and um, God made us uneasy for a while and then mm. the job came up and we applied for it and uh, we got it. We knew that if God didn't want us to have that, he wouldn't. Let us take that position. And then uh, it was one of the, probably the most painful things we ever did was to actually tell uh, the people we loved and the community that we loved that we were leaving that community to come down here. But we were very affirmed and confirmed even by them mm. that, you yeah, know, that 
if you're going to leave Evans Head, that's okay to do that for that. Some of them said if you had gone to another church, they would have felt like we were cheating on them. Yeah. <laughs> so that was an interesting comment. Yeah, it is a strange <laughs> thing in our denomination, isn't it? That, yes. you know, you've almost, one con- congregation's got to almost woo and steal the yes. minister yes. to come. Yes, to come across to someone, particularly if you're in a space, yeah. in a place that uh, you're, you love them, they love you. Yeah. And, and you actually see God doing some amazing yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not like you're feeling that you need to leave, mm. but God really stepped in, I think, and opened up an area uh, that was sitting in our hearts, mm. Karina and I, um, and did that a lot earlier than what we thought. Now, this is a significant issue because, um, and I want to. This is what I really want to talk to you about mm. today. Mm. Uh, mm. In the Anglican Church in Sydney, in the Presbyterian Church throughout New South Wales, mm, mm. it's been variously. This problem has been variously referred to as the the, the minister drought mm, or mm. the coming cliff. Even yes, yes. What's going on, Paul? What are some of the? Give us not just dry data and statistics, but yeah. what are some of the scenarios that you're seeing across the board mm-hmm. amongst evangelical churches in our state? Yes. Uh, well, I, I think it, it is something across the evangelical churches. Mm. I think it's something that we've noticed um, generally is I'm, I'm part of a pastor of pastors group uh, right. that meets and then there's uh, people from the Anglicans, the Baptists, uh, Evangelical Church of Christ, a number of people from lots of... And they're all talking about this in, uh, in different forms. Uh, I think for us at Ministry and Mission, we've uh, spent a time to think specifically for our denomination and specifically for New South Wales. Um, and we've come up with about uh, 11 or 12 points that okay. we think or things that contribute to it. Okay. So maybe if I could run through those for Please. you. Some of those are figures, but only at the initial part. And then the other ones are just observations in one sense. Okay. Um, and I suppose when we were saying this, they're observations. I don't think we've come up with complete answers yet by any means. Mm. Um, but we are definitely thinking through them and um, starting to put in place thinking about how do we move to seeing this drought break. Uh, One of the things we did just over 12 months ago was just look through our people who are in pastoral ministry, uh, ordained people in pastoral ministry specifically, and we saw that in the next five, so now it's next uh, five to six years, this was last year, we saw five to seven years, there's going to be at least 30 guys who are heading towards retirement. Now in that, some people go like past 67. Mm. Uh, we've got a dear old mate called Fred Moncton down in there, and I think he's 80. Oh. Dear old Fred, he's a great, great mm. value. Um, but he's the unusual. <laughs> mm. Most of us are sort of heading to think about some form of retirement by particularly out of pastoral ministry. So we've got about 30 heading out in the next five to six years. Uh, then we looked at the number of people who are either are stepping out of ministry for either burnout or stepping into roles like myself for chaplaincy in that sense. So that's out of the, the congregational pastoral ministry. And right. we're looking at three to four probably per year, mm-hmm. and that may be underestimating. Each year is a little bit differently. Okay. Uh, so when you look at when you put those two figures together, you're looking at around about 51 to 55 people in our denomination who will be stepping out of ministry. We only have 180 people mm. in ordained ministry, so that's almost a third of our stepping out in what time frame? In the next five to seven years. Okay. Uh, so that's that's a large number of people. So then the obvious question is. Compared to yeah, what are how we many people in? are coming in? Absolutely, absolutely. So we're thinking that there's around about, uh, on current figures, we're looking between, it's hard to pick because it, okay. it fluctuates, mm-hmm. but somewhere between 30, 35 people coming in through college system, maybe slightly high, but that's still leaves us with a lot, of, uh, a lot not there. Mm-hmm. But part of that too is interesting that within our denomination specifically, and I think this is a, across the board to a degree, um, the people who are coming through college... A lot of them were finding that when they get to the end of college, they're already connected to a congregation. Okay. And maybe they've even come from a congregation. Cornerstone, great space, you know. Mm. You've been raising up people to go to college and so forth. Um, uh, And then they're going back to that same congregation or Mm. very connected in some way. So the last two years, for example, we've only had uh, one person and possibly one person this year who will go into a vacancy. Mm. So even though we may be having... 
say, 35 people in the next seven years coming through college, um, of them who are actually going to fill vacancies, we're actually seeing there's a diminishing return in one sense. Yeah. So that, that's not a bad thing, by the way. Don't, get, don't hear mm. it that it's bad that people are, churches are raising up people and they're coming back to their churches to mm. – because those churches are growing. They're multiplying. You know, they're, mm. That's an exciting thing. Yep. Uh, that's a really good thing. Uh, so we're seeing that. So that means we're getting even diminished amount of people who are going through our college system uh, who will come out and actually fill vacancies. Can I just interrupt you just for a second? Sure. I know there's a lot of things you, you that I – you know, out of those 12 points uh, yeah. I, I want you to address. But yeah. a question that, that comes up quite regularly is, you know, back in the day, um, uh, older ministers would, would tell you, I think I was one of them, you know, you would graduate from college, um, M&M would give you an envelope, <laughs> you'd open the envelope, you'd look at the map and you'd go, well, that's where I'm going. Yes, right? yes. Today yes. it's sort of really pendulum swung the other way where yep. students are just finding the, the parish they want to go to. Is there something lost in, in that old system of actually saying, look, here's the need. Mm. As a mm. denomination, we really need you to consider your, um, oh, let's say, duty to, to go there and, and we will wisely consider it. What's your, what would be your response to that? Look, I think that's something that we've noticed right? Um, and we've been thinking through. I, I, the pendulum the other way I think was unhelpful and, and unhealthy because mm. actually people got placed in... Really hard to Very difficult places yeah. that probably shouldn't have had anyone placed there. Mm. I'm definitely not an exit student mm. anyway. Um, and the other way, as you say, like it is almost that way. I think one of the things at m M&M that they've been trying to do and we've continued to do at m M&M is to actually match people. Uh, it, it is a little bit like a courtship in that sense of actually yep. here's a person, they're particularly gifted in this area, so forth. We, we will try and match them and we'll try and start that relationship and if that relationship comes together, that's great. Mm. I think what we're finding at the moment is that those relationships are already there before we even step into that. thing, And we've, we're loath to change that in one sense because they're probably very good fit. But we do lose the option in one sense of saying, well, you go here. Mm. Uh, but maybe out of this what we're hoping is that if we raise uh, the uh, the understanding and the knowledge that actually there is real difficulties, uh, us filling vacancies, because one of the things that, one of the points is that um, that in Sydney, in the Presbyterian Church in New South Wales, there's not a lot of vacant churches in the city at this point in time. Okay. But I'm telling you, a lot of the people who are in the city at the moment are going to be retiring in the next five to seven years too, so there, there will be. Mm. We're heading that direction. Most of our vacancy places are outside of the city. And part of the problem is we don't have a lot of people who want to go outside of the city. Mm. Be that people coming through college or be that people who are already out there. Mm. Um, you know, there's almost, sometimes there was almost that sense that you you did your, mm-hmm. did your practice out here and then you did your real ministry in yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, we need to change that. As well, we need to be saying, no, that's real ministry out there. So yeah, that well, is like, vital to yeah. have people out there. Evans Head so, is a classic well, example. example. Yeah, mm. you know, it what looks small but ends up being an amazingly vibrant place that uh, sent people out into ministry, that was seeing people converted. Mm. Uh, and, and there's places like that all around the state. I mean, mm. there's some great country churches. Um, so I think one is we need to raise the profile to say, hey, there is a big need and there is a big need for the country. Mm. And so really think about that. Um, be thinking that this could be an option for you rather than just staying in the city. Uh, one of the other things I think that uh, I've noticed, I listened on the pastor's heart, they were talking about particularly in the Anglicans, there's also people who, the, one of the points we've got down here is that people don't particularly want to first go out and step into there, that they've got everything, that they've got to be doing everything. They want to be an assistant first. Yeah. Uh, and the curate system in the, in the Anglican church sort it of fosters that. Well. Mm. Yeah, and, and there's there's good about that, isn't there? Mm-hmm. Really good things about that. Mm. Um, but it does mean that the little country parishes who are going to have the one guy who's going to have to try and do everything, at mm. least to start with, um, that's that's a tough call for people to go to. Mm. So that's another that's another one of the, the 12 that we've, we've recognised as Should well. Should we so be encouraging our seasoned older ministers to go back to country parishes? That, that would be a, that would be. We are talking. Uh, one of the think conversations I have with people um, is: Would you like to go back and support or help or be one of those interim ministers that can go back out and uh, encourage that? Uh, but at the same time, I think we don't want to 
say that it's just for the older guys to go mm. out there. We want young families to. Yeah, I'm not saying that young families are the only things that grow no. country churches, but mm. but in one sense, if we are going to grow, like attracts like a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if we're going to grow country churches, we need to have young families heading out there as well. So it's a it. It, it's tricky, isn't it? It's not a, there's not a one answer mm. to all these things, but it's mm. this. In one sense, we need to raise the profile. We need to show the need and then pray that God changes mm. people's hearts. Mm. To wanna, wanna one, step into training for ministry. Two, step into going outside of Sydney. Yeah. So that's another part of it as well. Paul, a, a big um, word that gets bandied around a lot these days, um, particularly with minister burnout, is resilience. Yes, right. yes, yes. Can you talk us about that? Why yeah, are, yeah. Why are we not seeing um, as many ministers? I, I think the Anglicans have particularly identified this. A lot of their mm. senior ministers um, not, are not necessarily um, resigning because of uh, moral failure or heresy, you mm. know, but mm. Mm. Oh, I guess you just really call discouragement. Yep. Um, yep. Or is that accurate? Yeah, look... Um, can I jump back a little bit later too and come back? Sure. There's a couple more points I think okay. that are really important about why we've got the the minister drought, but let's stay there for, for the moment. Um, resilience is a big word that people are talking about and uh, I was mentioning to you earlier that I think it's the, uh, the word that we're using that uh, in a sense puts a, a title there which has a whole lot of parts that go into it. Again, I don't think there's a one reason for particularly that people are burning out and stepping out of ministry, but let me just give you a couple that I've particularly seen that I think are there. Uh, One of the biggest ones, I think, is um, people understanding who they are in Christ, Mm. their identity in Christ. There's a... It's a big danger, isn't there? I think in pastoral ministry yeah. that your identity get, gets wrapped up in your in your ministry, in your ministry, yeah. And whether you're successful or not successful, whatever that looks like, mm. um, and so people get lost in that, and so they get lost in finding and getting caught up in that, and yeah. they get driven by that rather than getting driven by their identity in Christ. That That's a very loved. powerful point. Mm. Yeah, they're loved. You know, the loved children of God. Um, we've been adopted into his family and we're loved by him. That's where we find our identity. That's where we find our purpose. That's where we find our meaning. That's where we find our drive. It's to come out of that. And as soon as that steps out of that and into here, that's where we, I'm finding, we're finding a lot of people uh, burning out. So in that sense, you could say it's a gospel issue. Oh, it's absolutely a gospel issue, yeah. Because yeah. we're not finding our, our identity in yes. the gospel. yeah. And that's first and foremost. Mm. That is it. And, and that runs into some of the other areas particularly too because I think that the next one out of that is that we're not, be, we're not doing self-care well. So we're not working on our spiritual lives. It becomes a quick thing that we do and then we've got to get into ministry, mm. uh, the important things over here. But actually we need to develop who we are mm. in Christ, mm. understand that. You know, I think Calvin said it's to know God and know self. Mm. Uh, I think we've done a lot on the know God uh, the knowing self part, I think we give lip service to it a lot, but we don't spend much because we want to just get out and, and do the things out here so other people know God. Okay, so without being formulaic or legalistic, mm. what are some of the things, you know, like you're an older minister now, right? Mm. Um, you're going to say to, well, not just to younger guys, but to, to, to us that were in the thick of it, what are some of the the disciplines, the yeah, uh, the priorities, yeah. um, the emphases that we need to be doing to cultivate a deeper devotional life. Can you, you share? Yeah. <laughs> That's a big area, isn't it? Mm. Uh, but one of the things that a few of the guys I'm talking to are in the same realm of um, caring for pastors, mm. spiritual rhythms. I think that's one of the big things that people are talking about at the moment. And I think that's, it's that soul care. Um, it's thinking about how do, we, how do we grow that? How do we spend time there? Um, so there's a book called Resilient Ministry by, um, I'm not sure whether it's a reformers. Can we plug reformers? Mm-hmm. It? It's um, Guthrie Chapman. Uh, and they talk about uh, your spiritual life. You need mm. to be working at that and your spiritual rhythms, working that, you know, you, that you've got time, you've got space to sit with God. Mm. Um, and then they talk about uh, um, emotional intelligence and cultural intelligence. You need to be working on that, understanding what you're in. You need to be working on your family, 
Uh, that's a big area that they identify. And then leadership is the next big thing that they talk about. How does that work there? But the first and foremost is our spiritual formation, mm. um, growing in that area. I, I, I think sometimes we just need to slow it all down. We need to pull things back. Uh, I know whether John Mark Comer has written a book called um, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Really helpful to make us think about slowing our pace down so we can spend time with God, so that we can listen to God, so that we can contemplate what God's doing in our lives. Uh, so giving space in your week to do that I think is really important. Uh, giving you space in your month, your year, mm-hmm. I think you need to have your, you know, a daily rhythm, a weekly rhythm and a yearly rhythm where you're giving yourself space to spend time with God be able to listen to him and contemplate him and see what he's saying to you. Just on that point, Paul, I think it's a really important point what you're saying. Do you think there's a different pressure um, about hurriedness in terms of if you have a ministry in the city, which is very cosmopolitan and very busy, mm. compared mm. to, say, the country or even mm. the coast mm. where you work? Yeah, yeah, and I think there is. It's funny, though, I think you can still get uh, – the people who are burning out aren't just city guys. Yeah. So I think we need to be careful to think, oh, just the country's easier. Mm. Uh, it may be slower. I think relationally it's slower, mm. which is a good thing. Mm. You actually have time to develop relationships yep. in the country uh, because a lot of the time those relationships are the incidentals when you're down the street, when you're in the shops, when you're at the school, when you're playing sport. So for Evans, that's what it was like, a town of 3,000 people. I'd mm. be in. I'd be the... I'd, in the sense, they ended up because I'd been there so long, I was a pastor to the town. So mm. um, most funerals, most weddings, you know, this sort of thing went through you and you were just talking to people constantly. So you were – and you just had to walk down the street. Mm. So, that, so that I think that's, that's a slowing down in that sense. Uh, whereas in the city, I think that's a lot harder, isn't it? You've mm. got to book in time. You've actually have, got to find space. Uh, I've even found since I've been back here that, you know, there's a big pressure on people – to have both husband and wives working to be able to mm. support their family and buy their house. That's massive, that isn't it? And it's huge because that takes up a lot of time mm. uh, and then you don't have much space because uh, you've got to run, run after your children and we're involved in so many things. Just finding space because mm. we fill it with all these things, which, again, aren't bad things specifically. Mm. Some of them can be. Um, but no, they might be specifically bad things. They might be good things, but are they the best things? Are they really helping us to really grow as followers of Jesus? Are we spending time with him? And I think as pastors, we get caught in that because mm. we think we've got to have all these programs. We think we've got to have the next thing up and running, uh, you know, because everyone else seems to be really busy what they're doing. Well, let's run lots of other things and busy so that we can capture them into the little bits that we've got. Mm. Um, whereas we're tending to... Uh, fill up that as well and then we're filling that up for ourselves and then when do we have time actually for God to be the one that's actually by his spirit you know, filling us up and mm. flowing out of us. Um, we end up being dry because we're getting caught into the, that as well. Yeah, uh, And it drives back to that identity though, doesn't it too? Mm, yeah. It comes back to where are we and who are we mm. and what does that look like to live that out as mm. followers of Jesus. Mm. Um, so yeah, I... I I definitely think I've found being in the city that there is a lot more that fills up people's lives. Uh, in the country you can be busy but you can actually have some space just to sit with people more and you just run into people more even without the deliberateness. You want to be deliberate in mm-hmm. some ways but in other times it's just incidentals and when you're in the incidentals then you can be intentional mm. in how you share your life and Jesus with people and... Uh, I think in the country you can invite people into your lives a little bit easier. Mm. Mm. That's a, I think that's a, a rare concept sometimes mm. in the city. Yeah, but in the country you can invite people in. Uh, we used to do a lot and encourage people in the in our congregation to do life on life discipleship. Mm. So you actually bring people into your life, and so they see how you live for Jesus. Mm. Uh, and in that's also life on life evangelism. So you're actually inviting those who don't know Jesus into your life. And, and they see how you live that out as well. And it gains integrity and authenticity. And then that's where we saw a lot of our people say, well, we want to know what that's about. And then we can share Jesus with them. Mm. Um, it's jumped in a bit of a different direction, haven't we? But uh, mm. um, yeah, I, I think um, all those things run into the to the burnout thing. I, I think a couple of other quick things on burnout. Um, 
too high expectations or unrealistic expectations we're noticing with people. That is a number of the guys I'm talking to, particularly we're finding there's a, some people in their first three to four, five years out of ministry uh, are feeling the weight and are almost burnt out. That's really early. Okay, so, so what's going on there? What is their expectation that you, you've found, oh, that's just unrealistic? Yeah, I, I think they have... You've got to be careful in some ways, don't you? Mm. Um, their expectation when they come out of college of what church looks like is okay. not reality. Okay. So when they get out there, people aren't as on fire as what we thought they were. Their elders aren't who they thought they would be or mm. going to do because they're busy people too. Yeah. So they, they don't have the space to be able to do. And so there's this really high expectation on what people will do, really high expectation on what their elders will do and how they'll be part of all of this. And then they've got really high expectations on themselves because they're wanting to see growth. They might be going to churches that want to see that and, 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 and they're not seeing that. Uh, and then they're having conflict. So their expectation of what actually is there then feeds back into them feeling like failure and their identity again. So it feeds back. It's almost this loop that feeds back into that. Mm. Um, but that's huge. I think. Yeah, it's massive. It's a, I've, of the recent guys that I'm speaking to, that is one of the biggest things mm. is their expectations. Mm. And some of them who've come out of that have been really good in that they've actually worked out that maybe that's they've loaded too much on other people. Mm. They've, and they've got to come back and work on themselves mm. and not take on the fact that others aren't exactly where they thought they were going to be mm-hmm. or where they are now or mm-hmm. where they may even be. Mm-hmm. Um, doesn't mean that they've written them off by any means. They still want to encourage them to love Jesus and grow mm-hmm. in Jesus, but they've drawn their, drawn away from holding so much here that feeds into their self mm. and come back to who am I in Christ more and, and work out of that. Um, being uh, self-differentiated is a term that we've been talking about a lot lately. Um, that's, again, understanding that we are who we are in Christ. People can disagree with us and that's okay. Mm. People don't have to be just like that and that's okay. Mm. I'm going to love them, I'm going to encourage them, but I'm not going to hang everything on them mm. to come around to what I want them to be. Yeah. So that's huge uh, and uh, that's a really big part, I think. Um, identity in Christ, high expectations, conflict mm. is a thing that really is very... very so can I just ask, just on this, I mean, you're raising some very, very important um, points, um, particularly for young guys coming out in that first crucial three to mm. five years. Mm. What's mm. M&M's role in, in helping them? What does that look like on the ground? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And that's, um, part of coming, uh, bringing me into M&M, uh, being employed there, part of Matt and the direction is that we've actually, this is, this is what we're doing a lot of thinking about. Yeah. We are spending some good time thinking about that. Mm. Uh, so one of the things that we're, we're thinking about at the moment is, I um, don't want to give it away too much yet because we haven't completely worked it out yet, but something for the first three years when people are out of college, that I think the Anglicans do do this already. Yeah. We've got a pinch from. I think they call it potty training, yeah. post-ordination training. Yeah, something like that. We're thinking about calling it sustain. Uh, okay. Uh, so it's the how to sustain through ministry. So, mm. uh, so we're looking at uh, developing something over the first three years of people coming out of college. Mm. Um, it'll be, at the moment, we're thinking like a Zoom meeting, a three-day retreat and a Zoom meeting. Yeah, so three great. times per year. And it, we're just starting to develop that at the moment. So we really are thinking about that. Um, the other things that we're really encouraging people to do is to be mentored. We think mentoring is a really crucial part of being healthy in ministry. So older ministers? Oh, they could be older, but someone who's trained mentor. Yeah. Um, and it's not the old concept of uh, the old guy telling the younger guy what to do. Mm. It's more of along the, the Pete Moore, Sally Jones training or Tim Dyer training in mentoring um, and uh, Rick Lewis, who's my mentor. It's more coming alongside someone in pastoral ministry, identifying where the Holy Spirit is doing a work in their life and then uh, enabling and encouraging that okay. to, to move forward. So it's more of a come alongside, see what God's doing and then so help you've got to unpack that. that. What so do you mean seeing what the Holy Spirit is doing in somebody's life and then come... What, what do you yeah. mean? Uh, so it's actually listening to them. 
spending time listening to them, you actually get to know them, you hear their story, and it, within that, you give them an opportunity uh, through some resources to actually see for them to identify what God's doing in their life, to see mm. what the Spirit's actually moving in them. Where, where what's the Spirit? challenging you in here particularly it, it may be a character thing it may be a spiritual it may even be a practical uh how you're doing ministry but you actually come alongside them and then they self-identify in a sense with us helping them to do that mm. and then we sit with them and uh, work through some outcomes and some some focus areas and some outcomes mm. and then we meet with them regularly and help them work through that and see what mm. God's doing in that. So. Paul, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that there's people watching this and listening to this that are not just ministers, mm. that are mm. congregation members, elders, mm. and they're mm. going, oh, this sounds great. Mm. Is Eminem there just for ministers? Or what sort of relationship do you have with congregations and sessions and... Yes, yeah. Uh, we do have a relationship with congregations, but we don't have any power. Mm. Um, we're, a, we're in a sense... Uh, so our, um, our mission statement mm. is uh, to, to help congregations uh, in the formation, staffing and multiplying of healthy churches. Mm. Um, so we, we are more congregational and minister focused in that mm. sense. Um, but we can help support in that area. Um, particularly, we have. You can uh, do consultancy, sort yeah, of. Yeah, that's exactly right. So we've got consultancies that, that are there. We've got uh, groups of people that do that. We've trained people up in that area. They're not mm. specifically the, at the staff of MM, but there's uh, people that do that. So, um, uh, and there's teams that do that, and they've been really helpful. We've mm. got peacemaking that mm-hmm. we do, that we can actually come in from a congregational level and help with that. Mm. And congregations through their sessions can invite MM to to be part of, to listen to or to come and... And this is with, before so. the, the engine blows up, isn't it? It's like Yeah, often re- it happens when the engine's blown up, mm. more often than not, but, but it would be we, great if it was before. Mark. But when you start to see the temperature <laughs> rising and the warning lights coming on, yes. that's the time, or even before, to yes. say, hey, we need, a, we need a, a service. Yes, yes. We use the analogy of the... Um, we, we want to be more of the fence at the top of the cliff rather than the ambulance at the bottom. Mm. So we've got stuff for the ambulance at the bottom. We do have the peace man. We do have opportunity for counselling. Mm. That's run through Jericho Road, but we're the ones that uh, supply uh, support that financially. Um, we do have the consultancy stuff. We do have some things that can come in. Mm. Uh, but we're actually wanting to build more of the fence. So part of my role is to build that fence. And so we've built what we've called a smorgasbord for health. Mm. And we've got 10 plates on that that we, uh, that we have. And if you're going to go on our website... You can check out that small as well. You can give us a buzz. Um, one of the things we do want to say mm. to people is, you know, you can ring us. Well, yeah, I was, that was my next question is yeah. how do people get in touch with you? How do they yeah. access the resources M&M have? Mm. Do you, what, mm. what, do you, what do you search on your internet engine, Google? Or yeah, yes, what, yes. What do you put in? Well, if you do ministry and mission, Presbyterian Church New South Wales, you'll right. get our website. Um, I think our website might need a little bit of upgrading. Mm. I don't know. But um, on that you'll see there's uh, – Lots of things that just for congregations in regards to forms that they may need, uh, particularly when it comes to calling ministers or pastoral assistants, um, those sorts of things. There's some resources there around healthy church. There's some resources around um, for pastors and for churches in that particular area. Um, And there's some other things that just relate to the general running of churches. And happy for people to contact uh, you or Matt Oates directly? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, I suppose Matt Oates is the overseer, mm-hmm. in a sense, of M&M. Uh, and if you want to talk about church planning and revitalisation, talk to Matt mm-hmm. mainly. He's okay. the main guy there. Uh, we've been on a committee together, but main, got, got, Matt's the main guy for that. Uh, if you'd want to thinking about healthy pastoral ministry, uh, then it's me. Mm-hmm. Uh, have a chat to me mainly about that. If it's peacemaking and uh, conflict and those sorts of things uh, and welfare, then it's mainly Burn. So Burn Merchant has come onto our team this year. Okay. Uh, and then John Irvin's there and he's our he's our rock. He's our resource for <laughs> corporate history, I suppose you could say. Uh, he also works in that realm at the moment uh, mm. and because he's also the clerk of the GA of New South Wales. He mm. works a lot on code and governance stuff so he can answer those sorts of questions. So, okay. And then we have Lani. 
who's our admin assistant, um, she can answer a lot of questions and particularly on your long service leave mm-hmm. or leave things, she does that. And uh, one of the really good things, just quickly, is um, Anna Moss with the women's facilitator, uh, okay. industry facilitator. Anna um, comes in every second Tuesday mm-hmm. into our office and we're actually building, a, 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 I think, a stronger relationship there and um, she's been really great. She inputs into a lot of things that we do and, and mm-hmm. vice versa. So it's been really helpful, I think, too. So um, it's a good team. It's a really yeah. great team. Sorry, I've yeah. got to backtrack a little bit because you said something which really piqued my interest and, and you didn't get a chance to explore it. You have a smorgasbord of healthy yes. churches, 10 things. Yep. Quickly run us through what are those what, – what's on the buffet? I'll try and remember the buffet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we've got mentoring. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you want to be mentored and you don't know where to go, give us a buzz. We've yep. got a list of people to do that. Uh, spiritual neural groups. Uh, that okay. we have in our denomination, both for men and women. If you'd like to be connected to them, they're really helpful. I've been in one of those since 2000. Okay. They're very, very helpful. Um, spiritual new groups, we've got our refresh camp. Good to keep that in mind. Next year, it was supposed to be this year, COVID knocked mm. us out of the park mm. to try and make that refresh happen. Refresh so, camp is? So it used to be called the Minister's Family Camp. Okay. Uh, we've given it a new name, a bit of a new branding, and a bit of new direction, and mm-hmm. we're calling it Refresh because that's what we want it to be, a space where people... Uh, in pastoral ministry in New South Wales. But it is still for ministers and their families. It's ministers and their families, but it's for all people in pastoral ministry and their families. Okay. In paid pastoral ministry in the Presbyterian Church in New South Wales and their families. Okay. And when is that, just quickly? So it's uh, next April uh, 2022, and uh, we will be giving more info about that in uh, assembly. So that's another one. Um, uh, We've got consultancies that are there. We've got counselling service that's part of it as well. We've also got a transition conversations that we do. So What's that? um, That's something that we've developed for – probably came out of the fact when I left Evan's Head, Mm. I had uh, someone who took me through a transition, Karina and I through a transition, some questions and a couple of hours sit down and just think through what it's like to transition from one ministry to the other. The new one. Best to do that before you leave ministry, but it can be done afterwards. So I've done that with a number of people. From afterwards. one ministry, like as in pastoral ministry to denomination, or even from one church. Yeah, one church. Any transition, anything from one ministry to whatever next. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, we've developed that out of some stuff from some missionary organisations. Have been okay. really helpful, and some other things we've put mm. together on that. Um, I've got to try and think of the other supervision. No, mm-hmm. that's a, that's another big topic. So that's a, uh, out of the royal commission. Every if you're an Anglican, Catholic and Salvation Army, it's compulsory for every other denomination. It's highly recommended. So we're working on that at the moment. What so is that exactly? That's a big area. <laughs> Just in a nutshell. So supervision is, uh, the idea is that there's, uh, it's like professional supervision, that if you're a psychologist or a counsellor, you need to speak to someone else about being safe in your practice. Right. Uh, so supervision, we're not calling it professional, we're calling it pastoral supervision because we believe as Christians uh, it also has to deal with character as much as practice. So for us it's uh, come, uh, it's having someone who you can speak to that's going to help you be both safe and healthy in ministry. Yeah, because, oh, and this is a big topic and we might have to come back to this mm, another yes. time, but even, oh, I'm even loath to say it because it opens a whole can of worms. Yes. But I've noticed the other big issue that's come up lately is bullying. Yes, um, yes. You know, coercion or yes. abuse of power. Of power. Yes. yes. Um, yeah. Can I just say quickly, can you just speak into that space and what Eminem is doing in that regard? Because uh, I think a lot of people in our congregations would be really interested to hear about that. Yes, yeah. Uh, look, that's on the periphery. and what, Not on the periphery as in importance, but... We haven't spent a whole lot of time... But that's the next thing to But address. supervision is part of that. Right. So supervision is, is an aspect of that. So we even so what we're thinking from m M&M perspective, if you're mentored, coached or supervised, then you fulfil the Royal Commission's intent. Right. Okay? Right. So we're going to be saying that we're going to be encouraging that you're in one of those three. For all ministers, all for all, all paid... Everyone in paid pastoral ministry in New South Wales. You'll need to be one a part of one of those things. So we haven't got to that point of saying it's mandatory yet, but we, we, we're we not sure. We, we think that that might end up being the case because we think it'll actually come from outside us to be that. Wow. Well, um, but in that, what we were saying is this is part of being healthy in ministry. Yeah. This is actually a good thing. Yeah. You know, so we're actually this gives you a space to talk about ministry, your life, what God's doing in that, mm. an opportunity to do that with somebody else who can help you reflect on that. And then help you to do that in a in a God honoring way. Yep. Because ultimately, it's for the glory of God. Yep. All of this is so that 
we're out there loving people, helping people to know Jesus, mm. to grow in Jesus, and we want to do that in a God honoring way. Yeah, excellent. So, so that's what we're. So, supervision is is a, is a part of that, mm. uh, and we're developing that at the moment. We're going to bring. A little bit to assembly this year, but probably in 2022. Fantastic. It's a big area, so we've the further we go down that, okay. the more doors are opening, yeah, and more things we need to think about. Yeah, <laughs> so, so that's one of Look, them. Yeah, I think we'll have to have you come back sometime. <laughs> so we only got into about three of the reasons I know, why the ministry's right, out, no, mate, there's, there are, there's a lot of others out there. But the key thing here is, if anything today has piqued your interest, and there's much more we could talk about. We need, I think, we need a, a part two. You know, in a couple <laughs> of months' time or six months' time, um, but. My guest with me today has been Paul McKentrick from Ministry and Mission, or M&M. Um, you can Google them, just Ministry and Mission, Presbyterian Church of New South Wales. Um, I must say you guys are very approachable. Um, <laughs> I, I, I joked at the start by saying yes. you're the faceless men because, you know, <laughs> from M&M, and not just because it rhymes, but because so often in our churches people go, M&M, yeah, who's that? Yeah, what is it? Who this is, is it? who it is. Yeah. Uh, the, well, this is one of the faces. It's been a delight to have you with us. Oh, thanks thanks so for much. sharing um, so much of what you've had to say is wise and, and helpful and challenging. Um, I hope we can get you back again and we can talk about we, some more of these issues. We did open up a whole lot of doors. We did. We? <laughs> we did. But if any of that's piqued your interest, please look at their website, give them a call, mm. and I hope this episode has been encouraging and helpful. I'm Mark Powell for AP's Profiles in Christian Living. I'll see you next time.